Shekinah means the glory of God among the people. I mean, the building is one thing, but it's the place and it's the people. Along the North Saskatchewan River, there's two ecosystems that join here. And so uh, nature is at its best here. Shekinah is much more than just this building. It's uh, seeing things in a, in a new light. Uh, and this building definitely helps them to do that. In our Mennonite history, peace has always been a very important part of our, our way of life and uh, service. And, um, and here we'd like to demonstrate that kind of way of life to uh, the people who come here to show the world that we can do things differently. You know, we are a, a from the grassroots up kind of people. We are a people of peace. You know, peace with yourself, peace with your fellow man, peace in the world. We don't think war really has ever been a total answer. A Sakina retreat center, you retreat because you want to gather yourself up. Children come here and they have a lot of fun, but they leave with a sense of having met God. But the genesis of this uh, project goes back uh, many, many years uh, to, to the dream that the camp people are, uh, had originally. And they'd always had a dream for a larger uh, retreat center building at this location, but the kind of a building that it would be uh, had a thousand different visions. There was a sense of wanting to get a larger experience happening, to take it beyond the youth groups and the kids at summer camp to allow uh, adults and families. We have many different seminars, workshops, concerts, uh, weekend retreats with seniors, art, art and craft sessions, handicapped people, which weren't really possible before that. Uh, we also wanted to develop uh, a year-round program and, and to do that really requires uh, a building of a different level. It had to be, had to be warm and it had to be able to house people uh, overnight and for weekends. Uh, we also wanted to develop a more of an outreach um, on a an, an ecological and environmental level. Uh, the board, in uh, some wisdom, um, planned that we would build it not all at once, but over the years. And uh, we were thinking uh, of uh, a place that would ultimately cost about a million dollars. And so we let our minds go, and uh, we planned the various things that would be needed, the rooms and uh, the accommodation, the facilities that would be required, and services which that building should perform for its constituents. I was aware of uh, you know the discussions all along, the dreams and the visions we had, and uh, of what we would build, and uh, there is to be uh, an integrity of the whole as well as the individual building. Uh, it was built with salvage material. It was not some entrepreneur with uh, with a million dollars. Uh, it was uh, a lot of people, uh, volunteers, uh, putting their their efforts together to to build something. And architect Charles Alford, uh, someone who who loves uh, uh, the outdoors, loves the context, uh, and is part of the of the the total vision, uh, has been involved with the camp pretty much from its inception as well. Well, I really have to give uh, Jerry Unruh full credit for, for the inspiration. Uh, he'd been to a conference in Portland, Oregon, and they'd stayed at a timber frame lodge, and he came back absolutely on fire for timber. And there's this traditional timber framing that Mennonites do, and, and there's a logical link, you know, back to the barn raising days, and, and it is uh, a bit of a, a spiritual kind of a process to do a timber frame building. So there was a need to focus this vision, and so timber became our, our sort of uh, mantra. And it was um, really, really important for the project for uh, a focus like timber to have developed because it really got people thinking about how that connected to the Mennonite heritage, how it connected to uh, the, you know, the spiritual working with wood. And then once we started finding ways to recycle timber, you, know, you can see how that would just build in terms of a, a community involvement. It was amazing. It was just amazing how people just jumped in, attended and, you know, gave at fundraisers, participated in bikeathons, you know, to uh, 
to support the cause and it brought together not only you know church people but also businesses. It was getting a lot of different groups involved both for fundraising as well as for de development of the building as well as uh, actually being on the construction site. There are many aspects of of the actual process of cutting the timbers that uh, volunteers can be involved with. Uh, one of the uh, most important ones is the finishing process which just basically requires a lot of sanding. We had some people in their 70s and 80s that were out there helping. They were they sanded and sanded and sanded timbers <laughs> for weeks on end. Uh, you know they did any job that needed to be done. So all of these things uh, developed a sense of community and that, that was quite important to us. It was, it was as important to us as building the structure. We wanted to use recycled materials and so we heard that they were going to uh, destroy a pool elevator at Dunder. Well, we put in a request, no, don't destroy it, let us, let us buy it. We'll buy it for a dollar and then uh, we'll, we'll take it down. And so uh, the crews were assembled and good foremen were established and uh, put in place and they went to work. They took that elevator down from the top right down to the bottom and uh, hauled all the material away. Year by year, it gradually been used in building the lodge. Well, there was a, a massive amount of plywood, and uh, it was all built back when they used common nails, so you could uh, pop it loose and uh, take out the nails and use the use the wood, uh, use the use the shiplap, use the two by sixes, use the two by eights. Uh, so there's a lot of salvageable material. A lot of the work that the contractor typically has to do is organize things in advance of actually knocking the building over. But in this case, all these volunteers did a lot of the groundwork for them. So it was quite a clean process. And once the elevator was knocked over, we had volunteers like ants scurrying around and taking just about everything that was movable and organizing it into a way that could either be sold or used at Shekinah. So it, it was a very interesting process to see. And uh, it really engaged the community uh, around the Timber Lodge project, but also in the immediate area of Dundurn. Uh, the farming community uh, really got excited about their elevator becoming something else. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, sorrow in rural Saskatchewan around these elevators coming down. And uh, for them to see this elevator becoming something else was, was really good. And the plywood was being recycled from the annex, and there must have been a dozen ladies uh, pulling nails. And there were six or seven big buckets of nails that they had pulled out of these plywood. You could never afford to do that, you know, the labor and you've got a, a passionate, fiery belief in something. It's amazing what you can do. And this building is really about that kind of a, uh, a passion. There's just thousands and thousands of hours of volunteer work at different phases of the building. Old timber looks bad until you take a drill and drill a quarter inch or a half inch into it and you realize there's beautiful wood underneath the, the gray patina of weather. We all realized quite quickly that there was, there was uh, uh, a, good, uh, a good reason for us to use recycled material to, uh, to develop at least a portion of the lodge. Now this is actually a, a, a fairly small piece of timber. Typically what we used on the lodge was, this is a six by six, but what we used on the lodge were uh, everything from about 14 by 14 inch pieces to uh, 10 by 10 and 8 by 10 for most of the uh, white pine structure. This is a piece of the elevator. This, this piece is actually from, from the Dundurn elevator that we took down and, and you, can, you can see the weathering on it. All the grain slid down over, the, over this board year after year after year and uh, it was like a desert wind blowing over a piece of wood. It left the grain of the wood perfectly intact. And so these boards were seen, hey, what can we do with those? And uh, uh, the, uh, the former director, Carl Wiens, a very creative, uh, insightful person, said, yes, we can use those and uh, use them around the fireplace and around the railings and around the stairways. And uh, it's very uh, well done. Uh, there's, a, there's a character to a building uh, that it has uh, a lot of wood like this. Wood is alive uh, uh, it, um, and it creates an atmosphere which I think you don't get with other building materials. So.
at the uh, Timberframe conference outside of Portland. It, I ran into two guys, the uh, Peters brothers um, from Steinbeck uh, in Manitoba, and they were of Mennonite background, so they understood very quickly what I was talking about when I mentioned the concept of Shekinah. And, uh, we designed it, developed plans, worked with them on the engineering of it, and they had an understanding of the community building that we were trying to do as well as the construction project that we had underway. In uh, the beginning of July, we had uh, about a dozen guys out, uh, along with the uh, Peters brothers, um, uh, to do a one-week-long timber frame seminar. And they brought in timber, um, white pine, from uh, and this is green white pine from uh, northern Ontario. We decided to build the first two bents. Uh, a bent is basically a cross section of the entire building, and those be those bents get built in pieces, put together as a as a flat structure, and then lifted. And what we wanted to do is do two of those because when you lift the first one. You hold it in place, you lift the second one and put the cross pieces in between and that starts the structure. And that, that uh, timber frame workshop uh, was very successful. We, uh, we got both bents up. It, it took basically six weeks of full-time work for uh, four main guys that were cutting. Uh, the Peter boys had, uh, had two other of their uh, uh, employees with them. Uh, and other people helped out as they could and as I, as I mentioned a lot of people were working at sanding and and uh, cleaning timbers and finishing timbers and getting them ready for the raising. All the pieces were pre-cut um, and it's it's critical that you've got uh, one guy who does all the marking and that person has to be incredibly accurate. Uh, we're talking uh, cutting cutting halfway through a pencil line that would be then cut with a razor blade before we actually did any uh, work with the mallets and chisels so that you get a perfect, perfectly clean cut where the chisel goes into the piece of timber. So all the mortises, all the tenons, all the pieces were cut, labeled and stacked in, rever in reverse order so that the first pieces to be put together into the bents that were laying on the main floor of the lodge would actually be the last pieces to be raised. The first piece was at the bottom, then the next bent would be built on top of that, and the next one on top of that. Mm -hmm. So the, the crane would lift that bent, and we would have scaffolding and cross-tying timbers uh, in, ready and in place, and they, they go together like a, a big wooden puzzle. Uh, they get uh, lifted into place and then the bents get squeezed together so that the tenons that go into the mortise pockets on, on each bent uh, grab and connect as they go up. So on the main floor the, uh, the beams connect first as the pieces are pull, pulled together and then you go, you work your way up to the rafter pieces, the top rafter pieces that slot in as the whole unit comes together. Once it comes together it's locked in place with the oak pegs, and then it's on to the next. We took three days to raise the remaining five bents and complete the uh, the basic timber frame without any shell on it. This was all timber, all hand cut, all pegged together with oak pegs. It's, uh, in a traditional architectural practice, you have uh, a division of disciplines around the architecture, uh, the structural engineering, the mechanical engineering, and the electrical engineering. With a project like this, timber framing actually drives the whole project. Timber framing is a whole way of building a building and timber framers that are good at it know what to do. So you just have to lay out the basics and they take it from there. And it's just a privilege and a pleasure to watch them work. It's, it is absolutely spiritual and religious and uh, you know once you see true timber framers uh, working with this material it, it's really easy to be the architect because you just have to uh, understand the basic dimensions of the bents and the, the limitations of the material and they do it all and it's just it's like the old arts and crafts tradition of architecture where you, uh, uh, you vision the basic concept of the building and the contractor just builds it something that's done traditionally as opposed to something that's done in a, in a scientific in a modern engineering sense it's traditional in timber framing construction to to put a little fir tree right at the last peg that goes into the into the frame and that's just a, a holy time for timber framers. 
Now the, the roof panels, uh, which were about a foot thick, uh, called a stress skin panel, which is, is a structural panel that is typically made out of drywall on one side, four, six, eight inches of solid foam in the middle and sheeting on the outside. And those are compressed together to develop uh, a structural element. And those pieces were lifted up by crane and dropped into place. And each, each one of those panels was designed to fit between uh, two timber frame rafters and uh, the cross pieces. So each piece would, would sit uh, in an area just above those timbers. So you, you wouldn't see any joints. Uh, it dealt with um, a, a huge issue of having the drywalling joints and taping. The exterior walls are built outside of the actual timber construction. <clears throat> the timber frame uh, posts and beams, all of that is inside the outer envelope of the, r the roof and the walls um, for several reasons. One, aesthetically we wanted it inside. Secondly, it allows us to create a, uh, an entire envelope of insulation around the outside of the structure. And we had lots of drawings for little bridges and trails and connecting things and none of them happened anything at all remotely like the sketches that I had done. And I'm really pleased about that because what we see here is uh, you know, the amphitheater development and, and it, uh, it's all come about through the work of, again, volunteers that are largely based here and really have gotten to know the building and the location over time. So the, the trails and the landscaping that's been developed is, is growing naturally from the building as well. Uh, the stonework that was done around the building was mostly local farmers bringing stones and actually laying them themselves. It was years of stonework. With the help of artist Kathy Thiessen, uh, Kathy did the initial designs for me and then uh, I fine-tuned uh, uh, the, the designs because of what you can do with glass and what you can't do with glass when you're breaking it and cutting it. The two outside windows, the large windows, the, they're a little over, they're almost six feet across and about three and a half feet high. So we had to fit uh, template into the window to get the exact uh, uh, shape. As I was building, I knew the colors I was working with, but until you get the outside light into it, you really don't know what it's going to look like. This eagle on the south side of the building, as the lights change outside, the colors change. There's definitely a certain kind of clientele that comes to a place like this. Um, people who want to get away from it all, and that includes cell phones, your computers, <laughs> so that you can actually focus on the agenda that is at the table. Uh, school groups who are wanting to create more team building aspects to create some cohesiveness in their student councils. We have a number of nonprofit organizations, small government agencies, teacher in services. You also have business, small business groups that will come and have meetings just for the day. I was on the committee to plan kitchen when this building was being planned. We had uh, a lot of different areas that we wanted to cover to make sure we had a kitchen that we thought would be very usable. And I think I was quite uh, adamant that I wanted a large uh, square in the middle that would be work area, not just uh, countertops, but big areas in which you could roll out doughs and uh, different things like that. And, uh, she has many good recipes. I can vouch for that. Shekinah is developing a new program this summer in summer camp, and that is one of food service. Teaching children about where does your food actually come from, learning uh, what is healthy. We actually have the children doing some of their own meals, or at least a portion of their meals. 
they'll let's say make the dessert and the counselors are all part of that working together with the campers. It's also about teaching um, people to purchase fresh produce and support your local producers and so food traveling less miles so that you're getting it at the highest um, food quality possible. Since 1979 we had we probably had 120 campers maybe the first year and since that time it's really grown and we have usually about 50 campers every week in the summer. So there's uh, fall programming, spring programming and also uh, winter campouts. Probably five to six thousand students come here every year. When you drive down the hill and you see the river valley and, and you can experience community with nature, not only with people, it's helped me to, to gain a whole trust for the whole world. Children ages seven to 18, we teach them outdoor skills, leadership, um, community involvement, a lot of um, communing with nature and learning to accept yourself in nature and the people that you're in, at camp with. Quite a few people outside of the, the Mennonite Church who use the Timber Lodge. It's in big demand for uh, student groups from all over Saskatchewan. Uh, I teach a group of students in Saskatoon. And we come out every fall for a team building camp. Spend three days over here. And just being around together as a group really helps to bind yourselves together as a class. And it's a great way to start the year. Environmental consciousness is uh, something that was embedded in the very, very first uh, inspiration of Shekinah. So when you start to build in a place like this, you have to look at uh, ways of making sure that that's respected. And the idea of recycling, the idea of uh, energy efficiency, uh, building has a very high R value on the roof. Uh, the way some of these uh, things are put together uh, is responsive to principles of sustainability long before this was really fashionable because it just flows naturally from the idea of responding appropriately to nature. Uh, again, making way for future geothermal was something that the board members were uh, thinking about and talking about way back in the early 90s before a lot of people had actually applied those sorts of principles to a building. Uh, and I was a camper here for a bunch of years. My parents used to be directors at the camp here, and so I've kind of grown up at Shekinah here. And Shekinah has a lot of potential for green energy. The big first one, the big one, would probably be active solar panels, which are uh, solar heated water, which will mount on the, one of the roofs here, and it will basically collect solar energy. And, um, and so even on our cabins in, in the far corner over there, we'd like to put solar panels on those run them completely on solar. Um, our, pond, our swimming area here, our water slide, everything we'd like to do with solar energy uh, and really go in the environmental direction here. I think it's grown larger than what people had even anticipated. The nature of the building of how it was constructed increases their enjoyment and appreciation of the entire retreat center. I think it, even the timbers themselves are strong, they're sturdy, and yet they speak. The whole building is always creaking. It's always letting you know, I'm here. This building has taken 10 years, and it's still being developed, and it's, it's a very natural process. So uh, 10 years from now, as new people become involved, uh, they'll, they'll bring ideas into this, and, and it'll become just better and better. Shekinah is the kind of a place that could, could be around for hundreds of years. Uh, it's that level of construction. Uh, uh, the, the structure was designed for people to look up. And it's a sense of, uh, to me, it's a sense of awe and amazement, both in the architecture but also a sense of, it's a humbling sense that, that there is so much more that is bigger than, than us as individuals. This structure is, is solid, it is, shows strength, it has character. So I think of the, the wood peg, pegs, putting it all the dolls, putting it all together and holding it together. It's probably stronger that way than any nails would hold it. Now that way I think it exemplifies, you know, what we're all about and the way in which we want to build solid spiritual lives. 
If I think of the fabric, the fabric of community and how it is woven and how it is built, this is an important site for our people. Some place, something that unites us, something, a common bond. Sorry.